The following program is part two of two parts, each 90 minutes long. There is support material available at this website, including quizzes, handouts, and lecture outlines for all presentations. Consult the UCTV programming guide for the date and time that other lectures in the series will be shown. Okay, I probably don't have to do a weed ID on this one, right? Because I think you probably know this is, this is the yellow star thistle. And, uh, well, you hardly ever see it like I just showed you it. This is how you usually see it, right? In a, a massive quantities and fields. This is just down the road here, by the way. This is a distribution in California. All the red is the uh, heavily infested areas, and the orange is the lightly infested areas, and the green is where it's, it's not located. It's actually found now in 50, 53, 54 of the total 58 counties of California. Uh, not really found in the desert areas or the really high mountain areas and then a little corner of Del Norte County where it gets too much rainfall. Otherwise found uh, everywhere throughout the Central Valley and the foothill regions and it's really spreading into the coastal ranges. A few years ago they didn't have much yellow star thistle and now they're getting quite a bit of it in here too. Now there's actually a second species. I'm going to show you a picture of it and it occurs all in here. So. So if you map the two species, which look very much alike, it probably would cover most of the state of California. And here's the, here's the three species that we actually have of yellow-flowered star thistles in California. Which one of these is yellow star? Right, I'll say this one, the, these are the same ones. Right, center, or left? Right. Correct, that's yellow star. You know which one this is? This is called sulfur star thistle, and it's in the A-listed plant CDFA, California Department of Food and Ag, a listed plant, which means mandatory eradication. Uh, and it's only found right around here <laughs> in Folsom. And uh, that's why I, I collected this particular specimen. It's a bigger version of yellow star. This one right here is the one that's found in Southern California. This is called tocolote or Napa star thistle or Sicilian star thistle, common names for it. It's Centauria melatensis. And uh, it's more a, a dry land area, though you do find it up in our area. It doesn't form nearly the thickets that yellow star does. Its spine or, spines are a lot shorter. So this is like the small version of yellow star. This is the big version of yellow star. By far, 99.9% .9 of everything you see in the state is this one right in here, which is yellow star thistle. <laughs> By the way, that area that I showed you that it covered in, United, in California is about 15, 15 to 20 million acres. And that's about 15 to 20% of the surface area of our state. Now you can add in maybe two to three million acres for all the rest of the western states. So we have the vast majority of yellow star. Now, why is it that yellow star is so well in California? Why does it love our climate so much? Well, one of the reasons is that we don't have very many of the natural enemies in California. So when this plant was brought over, and it was brought over here during the um, gold rush into Oakland, but not from Europe where it's native to. Now, it was native to Europe, but when the Spanish moved into South America, they brought their horses. And alfalfa is native to Spain, and so they brought, or native to Europe, and they brought their alfalfa seed with them. And if you look at alfalfa seed and star thistle seed, you'll notice that they are very similar in shape and size. So star, star thistle seed was a contaminant of alfalfa seed. So when they brought it over, and they brought it over to feed their horses, because they brought their horses over with them, uh, they introduced yellow star all over South America, particularly Chile. And by the way, Chile has a Mediterranean climate just like ours. That's why they make good wines. And, uh, but then during the gold rush, the Chileans got on their boats, brought their horses, brought their alf alfalfa, sailed up the coast into California, into Oakland, unloaded everything, and, and that's how yellow star got, uh, got introduced into our state. So it's a very si similar climate to both Spain, which is again a Mediterranean climate, Chile, California. So why is it so aggressive? Well, one of the reasons is that uh, it will germinate, and this is, this is rainfall in blue here, and this is germination in green. And actually, I threw down a 1,000 seed, and I counted how many germinated over a two-year period, every two weeks, uh, to get this curve, or this, this graph. And you'll see that not, a lot of weeds will germinate during the first couple of weeks, and that's it. Because they're timed in, they're tuned in to, to light, and the photo period, how much light there is. But star thistle will germinate throughout the growing season as long as moisture is available. You can see that germination in green is always associated with rainfall in blue. 
And so that means that it's tough to control using a lot of different strategies because you can come in here and you can till or you can spray herbicides or you can use a hoe or whatever you want right in here and then the next rainfall event you get a brand new flush of star thistle coming in or even herbicides in here. So that makes it difficult. Second year, we still got germination. It usually occurs early in the season, the bulk of it, but you'll, you'll get it throughout the season. So that has made, uh, let's say, old strategies such as using 2,4-D or dicamber or garland, very difficult strategies. And tillage, uh, a, very, a very bad strategy because usually you'll end up with nothing but star thistle. So that's one reason. Now, right around now, this is kind of what you're seeing it look like, maybe a little farther along than this uh, uh, as a seedling. Uh, you see, in, oftentimes in heavily infested areas, you see mats of star thistle. And then you can go from, say, November to next month, April, and it'll grow so uh, uh, slowly that it'll only look like this. So it looks like the plant just isn't really growing over the winter uh, months. And so you might think or be fooled into thinking that yellow star thistle is not that particularly aggressive. It, it, other grasses are growing above it, like this in here. Um, but what, ha what is happening is that star thistle is actually growing very quickly. Uh, you're just not seeing where it's growing, because where it's growing is underground. So you start out, and you can see all the, the shoot material here is uh, all pretty much, you know, really hasn't moved much from right in here to right in here. But look what's happened to the roots. This is 24-day-old roots. It's only maybe a half a foot. This is a meter stick right in here. By the time it got to be 52 days old, that's a meter. So that's about three and a half feet. So we're about six feet deep on the root system here. Well, that obviously is a huge advantage for star thistle in our state because we don't get any summer rainfall. I checked it up. Right around here, or at least in Davis, we get about uh, from May to September, we average three quarters of an inch of rain. That's May, June, July, August, September. Five months, we get three quarters of an inch of rain. So we're a Mediterranean climate, very dry. And if a plant is going to survive in the middle of the summer or late in the summer, like this plant does, it better be tapping into some deep soil moisture because it's not going to get it on the surface of the soil. And that's why most of our annual grasses dry out in May and June because there's no longer any moisture available. Well, in California, hundreds of years ago, we probably had mostly perennial grasses all over the state. We didn't really have very many annual grasses. When the European settlers came here, they brought annual grasses and they overgrazed. And that converted perennial grasslands into annual grasslands. Now, all the annual grasses have root systems that probably go only this deep, where perennial grasses have root systems that go much deeper. So perennial grasses are much more resistant to the movement of star thistle into an area, but annual grasses just aren't. There's a whole niche down there in deep soil that is occupied by nothing in our annual grasslands. And so star thistle came in and said, oh my gosh, this is so wonderful, just me, and I get all this water by myself. <laughs> so it has taken over, and that's probably the main reason why star thistle is so dominant in California, is because of its deep root system. However, when you get a really thick patch of star thistle, and this is kind of, this is a growth curve, using different shading conditions, and what I was trying to do here is simulate what would happen if star thistle is germinating in October, November, December, and even germinating into May, some of those plants are older than others. Some of them are bigger than others. So there's some plants that are shaded by other plants, and some plants that germinated early are really big. Well, the plants that are, really, that are germinated early and are, are not shaded have root systems that grow very deep very quickly. So by March 20th, they're already at the bottom of our tubes, and we, we measure these by putting in clear tubes four feet deep into the ground and sticking a camera through them. To, see where the yellow star thistle roots were. And by, by March, but right about now, they're already deep in the bottom of the tube. So they're already set for the summer months. The ones that germinate a little later and are shaded a little bit, this is 80% shading, which is standard under a canopy. Actually, you even get more shading than that. You see how slowly those roots grew? And not, not till May did they reach the end of the tube. And the ones that were really shaded, which would be the ones under a heavy canopy, uh, never reached the tube. So most of their roots were shallow. So when you get a heavy root in, or heavy star thistle infestation, you actually have plants that have shallow roots, medium-sized roots, deep roots. They start using the moisture everywhere in the soil and nothing can grow but star thistle because there's almost no soil moisture available for anything else to grow. And that's what, why you typically get, from, you go from moderate infestations to solid patches of star thistle because they just, nothing can compete with these plants. 
Now, they, there's a couple other really interesting factors that allow uh, star thistle to, to survive so well in a really hot climate like, like we have in a central valley during the summertime, where it can easily get above 100 degrees for many days in a row. We have intense sunlight. There's almost no uh, cloud cover for long periods of time in California. And a lot of plants can't deal with that very well. The reason is because it's just too much radiation and it's too hot. So plants burn out. Uh, but star thistle has a couple of mechanisms that allow it to survive very well and, again, be more competitive with a lot of other plants. And one of those is that you'll notice when you look at star thistle now, it's fairly green. But you come back in the summertime and that plant looks a, a more bluish green. It's got a more a whitish cast to it. You, you notice that? You remember that, seeing it like that? Well, that is actually due to hairs and wax that the plant is producing. And this is much like standing out there with a black car and a white car, and you're in the middle of the summer, and it's 100 degrees, and it's full sunlight. If you touch the black car and you touch the white car, you know which one's going to be a lot hotter, right? It's going to be the darker car. And the reason is because that absorbs more radiation, where the white car reflects more radiation. So that's exactly what star thistle is doing. As it gets into the summertime, it's making itself lighter in color so it can reflect more radiation and not overheat. That's one way it survives a really hot climate. The other way is, you notice that the, the stems here are winged, working much like a radiator would work. Any heat that it does get, it can get rid of it through these very thin layers that are on the stem. So it dissipates a lot of the heat that it does absorb this way. So it can survive in extremely hot conditions and have no problem. Here's Star Thistle looking <coughs> fairly healthy, very healthy, totally unstressed, this plant this picture is probably taken in August and September. Notice all the dead grasses and everything, all the other vegetation has died all around it. But star thistle does perfectly fine. So it's perfectly adapted to our California climate. Now where you usually find star thistle is in grasslands. You hardly ever find it growing under trees. From, so we go from this stage right in here where it's flowering and it produces two types of seed. It produces a seed that's a little darker that has no pappus on the top. You know the pappus is? The pappus is, is like on a dandelion. It allows, usually it's there to allow a plant to wind disperse. Oh, about 25 to 33 percent of the, of the flowers or the seed produced in star thistle are like this. The vast majority are like this. They're lighter in color and they have this pappus. Now that pappus is usually there to, again, aid in wind dispersal, but uh, this this plant and lots of other plants in this family have, have decided, well, look, should I put a lot of energy into the seed so I make a great big old seed and increase my chances of survival, but if I do that, then I'm not going to blow very far because I'm just too heavy? Or should I put all my energy into the pappas, making a little seed? The seed won't be, survive very much, but it'll, it'll move everywhere. Well, some plants went one way, like dandelion and, and salsify. They went one way. They decided to put it all into a pappas so they can blow a long way. Uh, other plants, like star thistle, put it all into the seed, and so actually that pappus there is for wind dispersal, but the seed don't, don't blow very far. They only blow a couple of feet. Ninety percent of the seed fall within two, two feet of the parent plant. But you do get some seed moving outside of the parent plant, and, and there's a couple of ways of studying this. One is you could, you could put a plant out there, grow it, and then you could collect all the soil in little grids and count the number of seed. That, that sounds like it's just too hard, isn't it? That's, I wouldn't even make my graduate students do that. <laughs> the easier way to do it is to put one plant out there, let them dump their seed, and then come back the next year and look at where the seedlings are. <laughs> and that's what I did in this particular case. So there's skeleton right there. You can actually see the white tips right in here. And one plant. So I came back the next year, and here's the pattern of seedlings. So you can see that the vast majority, this, this plant obviously produced a lot of seed, but uh, <laughs> You can see that the pattern of seedlings is pretty much close to that main plant. So this isn't the type of plant that if you say, if I control it in my property, it's, property, it's going to blow over from my neighbor's property a half a mile away. It's not going to do that. It'll only slowly creep into your, your property. So I usually tell people that have large area, and if their neighbors don't control their start thistle, all they have to worry about is controlling start thistle along the fence line once they get their property under control. So they don't have to keep treating with an herbicide in the entire field. If they want to get rid of all the seedlings, just treat a strip around the edge of their property. That's as far as star thistle is going to get in anyway. Okay, I, what I was talking about there is you, know, you don't typically find star thistle growing under oak trees. You don't find it growing under shaded areas. And that's its, its major weakness, is that it just doesn't tolerate shading. It has to be in full sunlight. 
And this graph sort of, these two graphs illustrate this. This is looking at flower number per plant, at the weight of each plant with light, product, light suppression. Now, if a plant is growing underneath an uh, oak tree, it's probably undergoing about 75 to 90 percent light suppression. So it's right in this range right in here. And you can see that the star thistle just is not going to survive under those conditions. It doesn't do well. It may, as it moves out farther towards the edge, then you'll see some plants surviving, but it really prefers to be in full sunlight. So you typically find this plant growing in open grasslands, not in shrublands and not in, uh, um, under, under oaks and oak woodlands. In the open grasslands, it will be there. Okay. Then you get to the end of the season, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what we call the Q-tip stage or the cotton stage. If you see this, you know that it's only star thistle. The other two yellow flowered star thistles, the Sicilian star thistle and the tocolote, they do not have this cottony appearance. That's not seed. There's no seed in this. This is just what we call chaff on the top of the receptacle where the seeds and the flowers sit. But it's a diagnostic feature that you had star thistle. All right, so that's an introduction into why star thistle is here and its biology. And you know, the biology of this plant is really important because understanding the biology of this plant, how it reproduces, when it reproduces, uh, has, how it uses soil moisture, has really allowed us to develop weed management strategies. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next half an hour or so. Well, we have a lot of different control options for yellow star thistle. Uh, some of them fall into the category of mechanical control. Uh, cultural control, and cultural control can be revegetation programs, uh, it can be grazing, um, and it can be, I will, I'll throw burning in here as a revegetate, as a cultural control program. Mechanical, well you can till, and I put hand pull in here, hoeing uh, and mowing in this mechanical strategy. I'll talk about those. Biological control, I'm not going to put grazing in biological because grazing is more of a cultural. You're actually managing an animal. So biological, I'm talking about it. <coughs> insects, where you introduce them and then you don't do anything else, the, the bugs are on their own. And, and of course chemical control, which is herbicides. So let's start out talking about mechanical control, or well, I think, let's start out talking about mechanical control and I throw in grazing. This is the only one, I only have one slide on grazing. This happens to be a, a right around your area. I noticed this a couple years ago, there was cows in here, they were grazing, there's a fence line right in here, there was almost no star thistle in here. This is before transline was registered, so I know this wasn't transline treated. And out here is solid star thistle. So I believe that the, the grower in here may have uh, used grazing as a management strategy. Now typically grazing is not going to control star thistle. You can suppress it, uh, but it can't, it, not typically going to work as a sole source of control. Bill Frost, who's in your county, and I'm sure most of you know, a uh, farm advisor here, he's worked quite a bit with grazing. I haven't worked with grazing myself. We are doing some simulated grazing up in uh, Northern California, but I haven't worked with the, the cows doing grazing. But it can be an option in, in some uh, areas, but again, I would integrate it with other approaches. Okay, let's get to, that's the only th time I want to mention grazing. I think Tom showed you a slide on that. Yeah. What about the comparison of growth? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. good. Also mention how it's dangerous. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, I didn't mention that, right. For those of you who own horses, star thistle is, is, is toxic to horses. It's irreversible. They have to eat about their body weight. It causes a lesion. You know, I usually have a slide in here of the brain of a, of a horse with holes in the back of it, but uh, people say, ah, that's gross, so I don't show it anymore very often. But, but um, uh, yeah, it will kill horses. Uh, it, it's most dangerous to horses when you put a horse in a pasture in which the only thing in there is yellow star thistle or when it's in the hay because it can't separate out star thistle from grasses. If you have a lot of other vegetation, oftentimes horses will avoid star thistle, but sometimes horses will develop a taste for star thistle and actually go select for it. So you should never graze horses in a star thistle pasture. Now as far as other animals, sheep are, are not as effective as cows in grazing star thistle, but they, they can be effective. Um, they, they don't eat the same way that cows do, but there have been mixed reports. Some say that, that sheep will work fairly effectively, others say they won't. Both cows and sheep will only graze star thistle from the time it bolts to the time it produces spines. They both will avoid star thistle once it produces the spine. Goats, on the other hand, will eat star thistle even in a spiny stage. So I would say more people would use goats as a control strategy for star thistle in a, in a small area than would use other, other animals. 
However, start thistle does have high protein in the green phase. When it's growing, rapidly growing, it's 8 to 14 percent protein, so it's really high. It drops off uh, after, after it starts to flower. But early on, it is high protein, and so uh, a lot of people, even raised cattle and sheep uh, raisers, ranchers, will, will, will graze on it. But for control, I think a lot of people I know would, would use um, goats. Yeah? Uh, you know, people have, uh, have uh, thought that, uh, looked into that a little bit, and I think that some of the seed do survive, yeah, some. For, and it would only be goats, because they would be the only ones eating it in that stage. Uh, probably not a high percentage of them, but some of them probably do. But birds are actually, she asked if, um, if when the goats eat it, if their droppings contain viable seed that would then germinate. And the same thing would apply to birds, because birds, do, finches do eat the seed, and they can transport them. Most of the seed is broken down on the crop. Some of them, a small percentage of them probably do survive. Anything else on, on that grazing? I didn't realize you were so interested in grazing. I figured you were master gardeners and grazing was not the thing you'd be interested in. I'd have spent more time on it, which I ended up doing. <laughs> okay, well, mowing is, a, is another strategy. Now, along the highways here, you're probably thinking, mowing? That's a strategy for getting star thistle. And yeah, it is. Uh, it's true. Mowing, mowing can be a strategy for selecting for star thistle like this. This is, this is an area that's been mowed along the highway, and now we have nothing but star thistle. And much of I-5 is star thistle, uh, primarily because of mowing. But mowing is not conducted on I-5 to control star thistle. Mowing is conducted on I-5 and other highways to prevent burning. So the timing of that mow is as soon as the grasses begin to turn brown, they'll mow. Well, the, remember, star thistle is, doesn't like to be light suppressed, doesn't like to be shaded, and it's usually in the rosette stage just as the grasses start to turn brown. So you mow off all these dead grasses, increasing the light, selecting for star thistle. And that's what typically happens on our highway. So you can use mowing improperly and you'll get star thistle, or you can use it properly and you can actually control star thistle. Now, when you use it improperly, I don't care how often you mow, I don't care what timing you mow. Perfect timing to mow, by the way, is early, very, very early flowering. You are not going to control star thistle. I mowed this plant at just the right time three times in a row. <laughs> See what I got here? I got a low-growing star thistle plant, but I still got a, a star thistle plant. Well, not only that, but I compared this to a plant growing right next to it that I never mowed. And I also then developed a perennial, is what I did. <laughs> Because you see, here's the annual, it's a big plant here, but it died because it used all the deep soil moisture around its roots. Since I kept mowing this thing off, it didn't use nearly as much water, so it lived longer into the year and actually survived into the winter. Now, in its native habitat, star thistle is considered either an annual or a short-lived perennial, and that's what I made this one. I made this one a short-lived perennial. So you, you have to, mowing doesn't always work. So you have to be aware of not only the right timing, and again, the right timing is early flowering, but you also have to be aware of the growth phase or the form of your plant. So for example, if you have a plant that looks like this, with a lot of basal leaves and a lot of basal branching, and by the way, that's the way they look like when they're in full sunlight. When you, have, when you are dominated by star thistle, when you're on the roadside, when you have an open area with star thistle, this is the way they look like. Now I come in with a mowering blade, and a mower blade is usually about four inches high, or even a weed whip. Even somewhere in your yards, you may come in with a weed whip, and you don't get it all the way to the ground. Now, if you cut it right at the base, right in here, it will not recover. There's no buds down below the ground level. But if you come in with a weed whipper or a mower or anything like that, and you cut it even two inches from the ground, and most mowers are four inches from the ground, this plant will recover. That plant will recover. I don't care how, and you can keep mowing it, and it'll continue to recover. So when you have plants that look like this, it's not worth even trying to mow. It, it won't do any good. However, what happens is that if you can get a lot of competing vegetation in there, and I'm talking primarily about grasses, and when does that happen? That happens if you are developing a control strategy, and you're talking about maybe the third or fourth year, sometimes even the second year of a control strategy, usually not the first year. The first year, you really got to hit the star thistle hard, then what happens is that star thistle hates to be shaded. So it doesn't put any leaves down early, except for the few leaves it has. It sends its stem up without producing anything until its stem can get above the grasses. 
And then once it gets above the grasses, it starts to produce these leaves and these branches are much higher up on the stem. And all the leaves that were down here all die because they're not seeing any light anyway, so they don't need those leaves anymore. They die. So now if you come in and you hit this plant with a weed whipper or a mower, and you hit it even anywhere from two to four inches, you, you cut it right here, there's nothing down below that to survive. And this is where mowing works really effectively. And so we've used mowing under these circumstances and gotten very good control of star thistle. So that's when you can use mowing. And again, you would, you would time that at early flowering. So this actually would be too early to do a mow. Now, sometimes people say, you know, I would like to mow, uh, but I'm not really sure. I can't, you know, I can't wait that long in my control program because mowing is a late season control strategy. Uh, you know, I want to know if my plants are going to look like that now, not back then, not, you know, back in July. So I say, well, go out into your field and see what your plants look like right now. You know, there's skeletons everywhere. If all your plants look like this, then I'd say mowing probably is going to be an option for you. If all your plants look like this, I'd probably say, you know, chances are mowing's not going to work for you. You're going to have to control those plants, get some vegetation up, and then convert them to this, and then you might be able to incorporate a mowing. So that's mowing. Now, I realize that most of you can't burn as a control strategy, but it is just an excellent control strategy in a grassland environment. It not only is very good for yellow star thistle control, but boy, it's just dynamite, dynamite for stimulating native plants, particularly legumes. And so when we want, when our goal is to increase biodiversity, plant diversity, I like to incorporate a burn into that strategy. But of course, it's very risky to burn. You know, you've got the problem of air quality. <laughs> And, of course, you've got the other problem of, uh, you know, fires, a 200-acre fire becoming a 2,000-acre fire. So you've got the uh, escapes fires. And, uh, and so that makes it too risky for a lot of people to do it. Some people can. Uh, not too many ran uh, ranchers can. Usually it's state park, federal parks, these types of people that can do these kinds of, of burns. And they like to incorporate this. This happens to be the Sugarloaf Ridge State Park in Sonoma County. Uh, they had crews that they, they could use to burn. Um, they had CDF that would help out and use this as a training program. They had the Kenwood Fire Department that came up and used it as a training program. And they cut fire lines and they burned uh, um, 200 acres for us in our, in our research program. They burned at exactly the same stage that you would, uh, you would um, mow, which is the early flowering stage this stage right in here. Notice there's a flower here and a flower here, a couple of flowers, but not a whole lot of flowers. Pretty much everything's in the spiny stage. The idea is that you want to mow as late as you possibly can before viable seeds are produced. You want all the desirable plants to drop their viable seed because fire does not kill seed that is on the soil surface. It only kills seed that is exposed in the flame. So you don't want any viable yellow star thistle seeds being produced, but you want all your desirable plants to have produced seed and dropped it on the soil. In addition, of course, you want fuel, and so you need your grasses that are in there to dry up so that they provide the fuel to carry a fire. So that's, this is the perfect stage to burn. And in California, at least in our area of California, that typically is from uh, towards the uh, latter end of June and the beginning of July. That's usually when we burn. If you're up in the very northern ends of California, you can go all the way into August and still get that stage. So you really should time it, though, to the phenology of the plant rather than to a calendar date. Well, when we did burn, when we first started trying this technique, uh, we didn't have any idea how it was going to work. So we came in and we burned the area and it, bur it looked like it burned really great. And then, of course, when the flames all died down, we walked out there and it was, it, everything was burned up except star thistle and it was all green. <laughs> so we looked at it and went, uh-oh. But what happened was uh, the fire girdled the plant. So it killed the plant. Two days later, you walked out there and the plants were all brown. So it actually worked, though we're a little nervous the first, uh, first day or two. <laughs> um, it doesn't consume the yellow star thistle unless you have a really hot fire. Now, just to show you what the results look like, and I'll show you visually, then I'll show you just a little bit of data. Uh, I had a fire line. It was about four feet across, walking here, and, and I had a control plot over here. The woman that I burned with, his name is Marla Hastings. She loves to burn. Her and her husband are... They, they both work for the state park systems, and they conduct burns everywhere. I, I don't know what their conversations must be like at home, but <laughs> I'm sure they're always, it's always hot. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I said, Marla, you need to cut a trail for me. I need a control plot. I need something you're not going to burn so I can compare the success of burning. And Marla's like, I want to burn it all. I want to burn it all. 
I said, you've got to leave me a section. So I negotiated for her to leave me a plot that I could compare as a control. Well, this was, this was my control. And, and you can see most of the green here is just star thistle seedlings, and there's a few flowers in here, not much. And I'm actually, I'm standing on a road here. I'm taking a picture on the fire line in the control plot. And then I just turn around, and I take a, you know, very same, two seconds later, I take a picture into the burn area. It was so dramatic, it was unbelievable. This is poppies, and these are all natives right in here, all these things you see. Now, the goal of this particular program was to enhance native plants. This is a recreational area. There was really no other option because they couldn't use herbicides. That would have killed the, some of the natives. They couldn't use grazing because this is a wildland area. Um, they couldn't use tillage for obvious reasons. Or, uh, they're, they're mowing, too hilly, too rocky. So there's really nothing else they could use. Now, I, I'm just taking a panorama of the same area, just t shooting the field. And it looked very, very nice. I mean, this is really attractive. Here's my burn line on the other side. Actually, they burned up here, too. Uh, so really, we achieved the goal we wanted to. Now, in this particular area, we burned three years in a row. And I realize that almost nobody can burn three years in a row. Uh, but we did it to see if burning would be successful. What I like to see, though, is burning incorporated into a management strategy. <clears throat> this is what it looked like in the summer. Here was my, my, my uh, fire cut right here. So here's all my, my control plot. Marla wanted to burn. Uh, it's, this is the day before the burn. So uh, all this green is star thistle, and here's the area that we had burned for a couple of years. And you can see it's almost all brown, and this is all the dried grasses and other plants uh, during the year. But they went in ahead and they burned this again that year. Well, just to show you what the data look like on burning, and, and actually this would apply to almost any control strategy, and it, but it really varies. The, and I'll just, let's just look at summer right in here, July. This is the total cover of yellow star thistle in that area. And you can see it's almost 80% in the year before we burned. So we went in and we burned that area. And we came back the next year, and it was 72%. So you would, if you quit right there, you'd say, this doesn't work. I'll show you in the next slide why it actually does work. Then we burned again, and we came back the next year. It was about 28%. We came back the next year, it was only uh, 7%. So we ended up with about 90% control, which is pretty good. Uh, the reason why we didn't see any burn here is, is because of the seed bank. And let's just look right here at the number of seeds that are in the soil. Uh, when you first, before you burn, we counted the seeds in the soil. Of course, we don't count all the seeds in the soil. But we estimate, uh, based on soil cores, that there are about 10,000 yellow star thistle seeds per square meter. And man, that, that's a lot of seed. 10,000 seed. That's more, more seed than star thistle needs to reproduce, to reproduce itself. You burn the first year, you get no new seed recruitment, you end up with a 76% reduction, or 74% 7, reduction in seed production. But you still have 2,673 seed. And that's enough to repopulate that area. So you've knocked out 75% of your seed, but you don't see any differences at the end of the year with star thistle, because you've still got a lot of seed. You have to keep doing it. The next year you do it again. Whatever strategy it is, you have to keep doing it. You have to persevere on this. 96% reduction, then 99.5% reduction. So start this little seed does not live 10 years in the soil. At least it doesn't appear that way to us. The vast majority of the seed can be uh, depleted in about three years. Okay, you still have a little bit of seed left over, but not much. So that's what that tells you. you ha the only way you can control star thistle is to get rid of that seed. Because it's an annual plant, and the link between one generation and the next is seed. And that's it. You get rid of the seed, you get rid of the plant. So you have to, whatever your strategy is, you have to focus on getting rid of the seed, whether it be burning or anything else. You can't say 95% control is OK. Yeah? How long will it take to reestablish? I'm going to show you that slide. And just towards the end of this thing, I'm going to show you that slide. Well, there's other benefits to, to burning other than stimulating a lot of native plants. We were able to get rid of a lot of other exotics. We were able to, to get rid of one of the worst ones here. I'm sure you know of it. A lot of you, rip gut brome, right in here. It hates to be burned, too. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end, too, because it's one of these grasses that has long awns on it. And then we, got a re uh, we reduced a few other introduced species, mostly grasses. OK, biocontrol. I'm not going to talk about tillage because we don't use it in non-crop areas. It's uh, really an ag, an ag control strategy. Um, and that's a, one of the reasons why you don't see very much star thistle in ag areas is because they do till a lot. And so they can cut that root off from the shoot, and then the plant doesn't survive. Well, you've probably heard quite a bit about biocontrol agents. And there are about five of them now that are established in California. 
Um, the early ones don't really work well at all. That includes things like Bangasternus, which is a seed head weevil. Uh, notice it's got a really short snout here, and there's no hairs on it. I'll co contrast this to another one. And then there's another fly called Europhora, and it's not in this slide, but uh, it lays a little an egg in here that forms a casing, and there's a little larvae of a, a Europhora in this little casing right in here, and this is a, just a, a, a seed of yellow star thistle, the outside seed. The problem with these, both of these organisms, the Europhora, which is the seed head fly, and the Bangasternus, which is the weevil, is that they only eat a few, they're, they're prevalent, they're everywhere, but they only eat a few seed in a seed head. And I've already showed you that you can produce a lot of seed. A heavy star thistle infestation can produce between 50 and 100 million seed per acre. And these insects will maybe eat 15% uh, of the seed. Well, and that doesn't, that still leaves a heck of a lot of seed. So they don't really work very well. Well, more recently, we've introduced two other insects. One is the uh, hairy weevil. Notice it's hairy and knows how long the snout is. Uh, this one is a lot better. This is called the Houston opus villosus, villosus referring to the hairs. Now, when this insect lays its egg in a seed head, and by the way, all the biocontrol organisms all attack seed heads. I wish we had some that attacked roots or shoots or leaves, but they all attack seed heads which is late season. You already got the problem. But this one, its larvae will eat every single seed in a seed head. The problem with this organism right in here is that it only has one generation a year. And it comes out uh, in, ju in June, or Jul and July, June or July, and it's gone by mid-August. And those of you who know yellow star thistle know it, it'll be, star thistle will be around till October, November. So it's not around long enough to control all the seed heads. We do have another insect called Caterellia, and uh, this is called a false, this one's a false peacock fly. And this one has multiple generations in a year, and its larvae will also eat every single seed. But they just can't attack every single seed head. There's too many seed heads. So there still is a lot of seed being produced. So we've been monitoring that for five years, and it turns out that the insects uh, will knock out 50 to 75% of seed production in yellow star thistle. And that's I think that's the best we can expect. Wow. Well, that's good. I mean, I'm happy with that. That helps, but it's, you know that it's not going to be the sole source of weed control. I mean, you're not going to be able to rely only on biocontrol. Well, in the early days when those insects were released, CDFA would say to somebody, they'd say, I want biocontrol agents. They'd say, okay, here's a deal you have to make. You cannot do anything. We'll put the biocontrol agents out there, but you cannot do anything to your land for 10 to 15 years. Well, you know what would happen in that 10 to 15 years. Yeah, the bugs would establish, but the star thistle would, would explode because the bugs can't control it by themselves. We're changing the way we feel about that. Now we're thinking that the bugs, they're all over the state now. Now let's use them in an integrated approach. Let's combine them with other strategies. They don't work with some strategies like burning, but they work with other strategies. <laughs> so anyway, this little insect, a little story about this insect is that it was actually a different insect called uh, Caterellia a genus. Caterellia australis, which is the peacock fly that was introduced here, and we thought that was going to take off. It didn't establish in California. It's doing pretty good in Oregon. It turns out that that insect, Caterellia uh, australis, comes out too early, and it needs an intermediate host, and the intermediate host is bachelor buttons. Well, we don't have very much bachelor buttons in California, growing wild, but when you get into Oregon, there's lots of bachelor's buttons. So the insect comes out. It lays its eggs in bachelor's buttons. The next generation comes out, and it's timed perfectly with yellow star, and so it attacks yellow star and did a pretty good job. In California, the insect never got established because it didn't have an intermediate host. It came out early. There was no star thistle that died. But all of a sudden, there was this one pocket that started to look pretty good. And the uh, entomologist went and looked at it and said, why is it working so well here and nowhere else in the state? So they said, well, you know, maybe we ought to re-identify this thing. So they took the insect in, and it turns out it's, it wasn't Caterellia. Australis. It was a different species called Caterellia succinia. And the only difference is like this dot right here. One extra dot. <laughs> but, it's, but it's morphologically that was the only difference. It had a huge behavioral difference. It came out much later in the season. It was much better on yellow star thistle. It attacked it. It built up its numbers uh, widely in California. But the problem that, that CDFA was faced with right away was they had never host tested this organism. Now remember, we have members of the thistle family that are fairly important in California, artichokes and safflowers. So I thought, of, 
uh-oh, we better test this thing, and we better hope this thing does not have an alternate host in those two species. Well, so they put a moratorium on reintroducing this thing anywhere in the state. Uh, good news, bad news for them. The bad news was it spread everywhere, but the good news was it was host specific. <laughs> it, it didn't attack anything but yellow star. So, so they, they, still, they still have a moratorium. They don't really care because there's no place left to introduce this thing in California. It's already everywhere. <laughs> and it works fairly well. I mean, it's one of the two. It and the hairy weevil are the, by far the two best. So we've got two good ones. Now, what would really be nice is, and, and it's under, right now under quarantine, they're testing a root feeder, an insect that feeds on roots. And it would be really great if we could get a couple of those insects out there. And maybe in combination, this would be our answer. Right now, it's not our sole answer for star thistle control. When you do get a heavily infested population and a low star thistle, uh, a, heavy inf a heavy population of the insects, a low star thistle population, you'll see that the insects will do some damage to the plant. They won't control everything. Here's some flowers that are still going along. But notice a lot of the buds here are destroyed on the tips. The insects like to hit the top ones first. And so you'll see a different form to the plant when you have the insects out there. I also want to point out in this slide, you know something else about this plant? If I had an alternative control strategy, what would I use here? Very good. You're already losing it. Mowing. Very good. Notice all the grasses in here, and notice the way it starts this will grow. Boy, if I cut that plant right here, it would not recover. So that's the way I, I look at a plant like that. That's the first thing I think of. I think I could control this plant with this strategy. Actually, hand weeding would be a very easy strategy with this plant, too. It's really brittle and thin. I could just grab that plant and break right off. So that's another good option. And, and you can see it's not a lot of star thistle in this field. So that would have worked. This was the field. This was, again, the Folsom site. Now, this was the year before El Nino. It was, kind of a, it was a drought year. And CDFA said, I think the biocontrol agents might work, and they might control star thistle. I said, we, I didn't know about El Nino at this time, because this was the year before. I said, you know what? I'll believe that if we have a really wet winter and, uh, <coughs> and we still see this type of a population. Well, the very next winter was El Nino, and that field was 95% star thistle up to here. So that told me that that biocontrol alone wouldn't work. Well, you probably, if you see star thistle, it probably has the biocontrol agents in it, and you can easily recognize them. Any seed head that looks like that, with the flower heads still stuck in the seed head when it dries out, has had a biocontrol agent in it. Because what happens is the biocontrol agents produce this gummy substance that sticks the flowers in so that flowers don't fall off. So that all those seed heads that look like that have biocontrol agents. So you can walk out in your field and you see yellow star or any field, and you'll see that a lot of the flower heads look like this. So the biocontrol agents are prevalent. OK, so that's, that's biocontrol. Let's look at herbicides, and I'm not going to spend much time except on one herbicide. Uh, maybe round up a little at the end. And that herbicide is, is transline, or, or chlorperolid, because that, that is the herbicide that is, uh, that is so good on yellow star thistle. It's, it's a growth regulator herbicide, so it's very closely related to garlon. Those of you who know garlon, triclopyr. It's related to 2,4-D and dicamba. It has four big advantages over these compounds. One of them is that it doesn't kill very many things. Now, you don't hear weed scientists say that very much as an advantage, right? But in agricultural areas, if you had an ideal herbicide, it would be an herbicide you could add or treat to a field that would kill everything but your crop. In a non-crop area like ours, we would actually prefer an herbicide that would kill almost nothing but your weed. And that's tough to get. Well, Transline kills members of the sunflower family and not even all of them, uh, many members of the pea family, and then not much else. Some other species are slightly susceptible, but not much else. It doesn't kill a rhodium. It doesn't kill any mustards. It doesn't kill any grasses. And that's an advantage in our system, because we really want other things to survive. We don't want to get rid of everything. Roundup, in contrast, is non-selective and kills most anything. So that's one advantage to it. A second advantage to it is it has an excellent toxicology profile, very low toxicology. Somewhere in the area of Roundup, but even, even less than that, because there's no grazing restrictions. You could, you could move into a field where you had cows, sheep, goats. You could move them to one half of the field, treat this half, move them to the other half, treat the other half. Now, even with Roundup, you have a week or two grazing restriction. So that's another advantage to it. The other advantage is that you're not using it in pounds per acre. You're using it in ounces per acre. This is ac acid equivalent right in here. But in total product, the rate I usually use is four ounces per acre. That's a minuscule amount. 
of an, of an herbicide per acre. So it's got low toxicity and you're hardly using any of it. And it's not very selective. The other advantage to it is that, that it not only is a post-emergent herbicide, but it works pre-emergence. And that is the big one. Because 2,4-D, Garlon, Dicamba, they'll control yellow star thistle seedlings, but the next rainfall, they don't have any soil activity, the next rainfall you get a new flush. By the end of the year you've got nothing but star thistle again. This one will give you a season-long control. So it has a lot of advantages over these other compounds, and this is why people were so excited when it was registered in California. Is it available over the counter? Yeah. No, you, you can get it. You can purchase it. You just got to go to your ag commissioner, get a number, get a site uh, number, and uh, you, then you can purchase it. Now, it's fairly expensive. The reason it's expensive is because you're not using very much of it. You can now, I think, buy it in a half-gallon container. It would cost you about, chemical costs, about $10 to $12 an acre. So that's what it costs. Now, for somebody who owns a, you know, a five-acre, ten-acre ranchette, that's not very expensive. Of course, if you own a thousand, ten thousand acres, that's a lot of money. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, you can't purchase, but you can't purchase it uh, by going down to the, the hardware store down here and getting it. Yeah. Uh, what is the best stage to apply it? Uh, see right here, this the slide tells you exactly that. I I applied it at every stage, starting from November all the way till April. And what I found, and, and let's not look at all these rates, let's just look at this rate right in here, two ounces, because that is about the lowest recommended rate. That's acid equivalent, which would be e equal to just a little over four ounces of product. So let's look at that. It didn't work so well in November, mainly because uh, it didn't last long enough. That's too early. It started to work really well in December, January, February, March, April. So you got a broad window, which we could use it at. Seedling stage. All, that whole time you're still in the seedling state, rosette stage. That's the best time. You can actually use it in the bud stage, but you've got to go with a little higher rate. Yeah? What's the second uh, rate? Uh, it doesn't last two years. You'd have to go, I always go with four, I, I never use it at anything but four ounces, the lowest rate. I, and I don't even use a surfactant with it. Now, if your interest is to get rid of most everything, do you want to treat later on in the year? If you have um, cows or horses that you want to feed on the grasses, you, you should treat earlier in the year, January, February. Because if you wait too late in the year, what happens is that the damage caused by star thistle on the grasses is already done. So your grasses come up really wimpy and you have no forage. You can, you can control star thistle, but there's nothing there. If you come in early in the season, like in the middle of winter and you treat, then the grasses just go boom. They just fill in and it looks beautiful and you have lots of forage. And I, I'm not showing you that slide because of time. But, so you have a broad window to treat, but if you want forage, early January, February is the best time. This is how effective it is. This was aerially treated. This was before we even registered it. I was doing a, a plot work uh, over near a woodland. Uh, this was aerially treated at less than labeled rate because the labeled rate wasn't determined yet. There's the line where the airplane went. No treatment, treatment. I mean. It was stunning to see how good it was. Um, we also treated by ground application. And this particular individual here, he was the owner here. And he was kind of in a hurry trying to get his work done as fast as he could. He had a 30-foot boom. He went back and forth through the field. And then he came back to me in the spring. And he said, um, you know what? I don't, I don't think this stuff works that well. I want you to come out and take a look at it. And I was really shocked because I had, I had done lots of tr uh, trials. And it had always worked really well. So I went out there with him. He says, see, there's all kinds of star thistle here in a patch, but it's really patchy. So we were walking on a field, and, I, was, and I, saw, I thought, this is too regular of a patch. So I said, what's the width of your boom? 30 feet. So he'd say, yeah, see the patch right here? Now there's no star thistle. So I get in the no star thistle, and I go, one, two. Of course, as soon as I got to 10, patch of star thistle again. Then again, 10. I said, you know what? I think you've got to skip. Let's see what it looks like later on in the year. When he saw this, he was a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> so his skips are all here. But he obviously, but this is a great for dramatically showing you how effective it can be in controlling star thistle. And of course, all the grasses fill in, filleries and whatever else in there. OK, so what happens if you're later on in the year? Let's say you're, you're, you, you're deciding, oh, I want to control star thistle. I'm already into June, July. Oh, my plants are really big. I wouldn't use mowing here, right? Uh, um, I wouldn't even use hand pulling. It'd be too hard. What do you do now? 
Well, you could use transline still, but transline is a very slow herbicide. It takes two months to kill the plant. So I don't really like to use transline when it's this big. Uh, the only time I would use it is if there was lots of perennial, gra uh, perennial grasses around. Because otherwise, I would use Roundup. Roundup is great on yellow star thistle at the late older stages. And so if you had a late stage like this, Roundup would be better. All your grasses, if you had annual grasses, are already dead. You don't have to worry about them. Uh, so I would really use Transline early on and Roundup later on. So. OK, well, now let's get into some other stuff, strategies. So we wouldn't do this here. We don't know how to do this here, really. But in Northern California, as I mentioned, we only get 3 quarters of an inch of summer rainfall here. Well, in Northern California, they get 3 and a half inches of summer rainfall. This is around Wairika. And so they can use, they can reseed with perennial grasses and get them established to try to outcompete yellow star thistle. And that's what we did. This is a, a wheat grass, pubescent wheat grass. It's a very good forage. And we know it's competitive with yellow star thistle. So we introduced this by drill seeding it in combination with Transline and in combination with Roundup, got rid of our annual grasses, got rid of our star thistle, got the perennial grasses established. Uh, two to three years later, this was an area where we just used Transline. It's nothing but annuals. And here's where we put the wheatgrass in. It's, it's uh, excellent forage. I'd like to be able to do this with native plants here in this part of the state, but it's really difficult because we don't have any summer rainfall, and it's tough to get these things established. But that's a long-term goal. So we can combine and use integrated approaches for, for getting rid of star thistle. And that particular area now will be free from star thistle for the next 20 years. So they don't have to have any more inputs in there. They just have to make sure they don't overgraze that perennial grass. So now, what, we, what we'd like to do now is, is when you have an area, what you really do is you're not thinking in terms of controlling your weed. You're in thinking in terms of controlling for something. And when you want to control for something, you really have to develop a long-term strategic plan. And that plan is going to differ depending upon what your long-term objectives are. So in your cases, it may be uh, to enhance forage if you own a ranchette. In other cases, it may be to have a, a recreational area that you can... Uh, you can walk through and enjoy the wildflowers. In other areas, it may be increasing biodiversity. In other areas, it may be for camping. You don't want these spiny plants all over the place. Um, there's a lot of different things. In some areas we're working with, we got rare plants. We're trying to encourage the rare plants. So the, the t what you're going to use and your management tools are going to depend upon your objectives. You may have limitations in what you can use. You may not be able to mow because you have a rocky or a steep area. You may not be able to burn because you have houses all around you. Some areas may not, not be able to use herbicides. So you have to figure out what are your limitations, come up with sort of a list of things that you can do. It's always nice to inventory your area, know what, how extensive your populations are, where they are, whether you have little tiny satellite populations or huge stands. And uh, you want to get rid of your satellite populations first before they become huge stands. You know the biology of the plant? Well, you already know that now because we talked about it. You know the ecosystem that you're talking about? In other words, what is out there? Do I have a lot of uh, uh, desirable vegetation that's going to replace star thistle, or is it all medusa head? And I get rid of the star thistle, and I end up with nothing but medusa head. Well, then you're, you're going to be sitting around going, God, remember those good old days when I used to have star thistle out here? <laughs> so you, you, you're going to have to change your strategy if you have something like that. So you should know that. Um, and then in many cases with weed management areas, and I don't know if any of you are part of the weed management area here, you want to coordinate your efforts with your neighbors or with government or federal or state or county agencies. And, uh, and share things, share information. Once you've started to develop your management plan, then you've got to look at your economics, which is obvious. You, you can't go with a revegetation program in many areas, even if you're in Northern California, because it's $75 an acre. Some people just can't afford to do that. So you have to look at your economics. And then you want to develop a multi-year, and we always suggest using an integrated approach. If you just use a single approach, you end up selecting for something you may not like. If you use Transline over and over and over again, you may end up with nothing but ripgut brome, or medusa head, or downy brome, or barbed goldcrest, things that you don't want. So you may want to incorporate that. Um, if you just use mowing, you may end up eliminating a lot of the late season things that you really like. So you have to try to use an integrated approach that allows you to achieve the things you need to achieve. You continuously monitor your site. It can be remapping your site to see how well you're doing, or it can be scouting like we did. We walk out and we say, how much star thistle seedlings do we have now? And this will dictate what we want to do. So you can do that as a follow-up program. And then finally, it's maintenance program. This gets back to a question that 
that somebody mentioned here early on. Was that you? Here's the data for that plot. Here was my seed bank. Notice the number of seeds I had in the unburned area, between 3,500 and 12, 13,000 seeds per square meter. One year of control, I knocked it down. Two years of control, I knocked it down. Three years of control, I'm really low. Now I'm in a situation where I really should have a maintenance program. That can be hand weeding. It could be spot treatment. It could be an occasional herb, uh, um, burning. It could be something to keep the population down. In this area, I didn't do anything. I said, let's follow the seed bank and see how quickly it recovers. First year, it went back up. We had a drought year in 97, so it stayed low. And then the next year, El Nino, right back up to where we started three years later. <laughs> this is the stage you want to get on, stay on top of it. You, otherwise, you're going to go, eh, it's going to be a little roller coaster ride right in here like that. You want to get it right here and stay on top of it, and you can keep it down low and maybe even eradicate it from your site. So it's possible. So this is key. This is seeds. Seeds are everything. <coughs> so spot treatments are good if you're just going to spray a plant or two here and there. So here, here you are. You're a ranchette owner. I suppose some of you are ranchettes owner, right? You have a couple of acres. The best it would start this. So what do you do? Well, what I like to do, and this is sort of the bottom line, puts everything I've said together in a little package for you. What I like to do is go with a early season control strategy the first year. Because you absolutely know you have star thistle, right? It's not a question of whether you're going to have star thistle or not. You've had it every year. So transline is a great first year option. It will reduce your star thistle population, stimulate your grasses, stimulate other things that you want to. Now, what do you do in the second year? That's the question. You asked me that question. What do you do in the second year? I would walk out and look at that in February and March. I would walk around, look for my star thistle seedlings, and I would estimate how many star thistle seedlings I had. If I had very few star thistle seedlings, I would immediately transfer into a late season control option. So I would not use Transline again. If I walked out and saw lots of star thistle seedlings everywhere again, I'd probably go with a second year of an early approach, which again would be Transline. Eventually, you're going to get down, even after two years, you're eventually going to get in there and you're going to see very few star thistle seedlings. Now, let it go. You're transferred into your late season strategies. Your late season strategies can include burning, mowing, spot spraying, hand pulling, and nothing. <laughs> okay? And sometimes, nothing is what you use because you'll walk out there and not see a single star thistle plant. And I've seen that happen in certain areas where they've had a really good spring, they've had a lot of vegetation come up, other vegetation, and it's completely shaded out the star thistle. Well, aren't you, you'd say, aren't I glad I didn't use any herbicide early on, waste the money and add herbicide that I didn't need? So you transfer to a late season strategy, and you can use any one of those options that you had available to you. And then once you get past that, you're going to, especially if you own four acres to ten acres, one acre even, you just walk your land in June. Star thistles up, you pull it out, hand pull it, and you can do that fairly easily. Prevent it from going to seed within a couple of years, you'll hardly see any star thistle plants there. So that's the way I would do it. I would start out again with an early season treatment and transfer into a late season strategy. Yeah? That's the reason. If you're going to hand pull, you hand pull no later than the stage that I mentioned for burning and for mowing, which is if you have about 2% of all of your spiny heads that are in flower, you're okay. You'll get no seed production. If you wait, then yeah, you, then you're going to get seed production. So that's why I would say if you go out in June, your plants are up. You may be in the spiny stage. It's utilized most of its soil moisture. It's brittle. It's easy to break off from the base, provided you know, it's got that skinny base to it. You can just throw it on the ground. It's not going to produce any viable seeds. So that's the time to do it. You don't want to wait till September to hand pull. That, that's a waste of time. That's just a feel-good exercise. Yeah? Bees, bees account for 50% of pollination. I don't know any way of getting rid of honeybees in the area. But, um, you know, of course, you know, Star Thistle makes terrific honey. And, uh, and bees are the main, main uh, pollinator. But, you know, other, other native insects will also pollinate it, too. But bees, bees account for 50% of seed production. Okay. 
Now, some of these are garden plants. Not all these are non-crop plants. Do you know this plant? Very common plant. A little closer up. No, this is sow thistle, but it's very closely related to dandelion. Sow thistle. Yeah, very common garden weed. You see it everywhere right now in the seedling stage. It's a winter annual. It's starting to come up and flower. Another plant that's uh, right along with it is which one? Is this one? It's prickly lettuce. Dandelion, prickly lettuce, sow thistle. And in your area, you know what else you have here? It's a noxious weed, and I think I got a picture of it coming up. I better not tell you until I see it. All these are in the same tribe. Tribe is a taxonomic. They're all closely related. How about that? You know that one, right? Chicory, right. I heard somebody say chicory. Chicory in the same group. And this is the one you probably don't know. Any of you know this one? It grows in Folsom, and it grows uh, um, probably not quite up to El, uh, Placerville, but getting close. Let me see if I can show you a little closer. So flowers are yellow, same sort of windblown seed. This is a noxious weed, big problem in some other parts of the, uh, the West. This is called skeleton weed. Yeah. Skeleton weed. Now, all of those plants that I've mentioned, and I didn't put dandelion in here because I know you all know what dandelion looks like, but dandelion, sow thistle, chicory, prickly lettuce, this, are all closely related, and they all bleed a milky white latex. Okay, so that's how, this one is an easy one to recognize, by the way, because it has hairs that point down at the base of the stem. So you, when you walk out there in the summertime, actually it was a little late here because I was trying to track it down along the railroad tracks of Folsom and I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a rosette, looks much like dandelion, and you can easily confuse it for dandelion. I may have. Another little common garden weed that's also in the sunflower family. All these plants are in the sunflower family. You know what this one is? This is, uh, I'll show you a little flower picture here. Little black tips right in here. See that black tips? Hillary? This is a common groundsel. Very common garden plant. This one is poisonous to cattle and the live, all livestock. It's a liver poisoner. And you only have to eat about 2% of your body weight. So this is a real toxic one. Yeah. This one right here? Yeah. Common groundsel. Groundsel, like ground, S-E-L on the end. Common groundsel. Very common plant. Uh, uh, you can find this plant. I don't care where you go in this country. <laughs> you grow vegetables, you've got this plant in it. This is a, one of the most common vegetable weeds when I was in upstate New York at Cornell. And, of course, in California, too. Roadside weeds, orchard weeds. You know that one? Hairy fleabane, major problem in California. The other one related to it is, uh, is the horseweed, both in the genus Caniza. And this is, a, this is a plant that's a winter annual too. It'll start, but it comes up actually later in the year. Also puts down a very deep root system. This is horseweed. The other one was hairy fleabane. They're both in the same genus, both closely related. So they're not, are they, they're not in the sunflower family? They are in a sunflower family. I'll tell you when I get out of the sunflower family. There's two major families of weeds in this country. And, what, and the other one is? You, no, families. Fam now, you guys all know this. And as soon as I say it, you're going to say, oh, of course. Families. What did I just hear? Grasses. Grasses. They make up the two of them combined are 67% of our weeds. Yeah. So you could these, these, where these things occur, you wouldn't use transline because they're not, these are mostly garden weeds. And you wouldn't use transline, transline's not used for garden weeds. Uh, that other plant, the one I showed you, had rush skeleton weed, nothing controls it. That's why it's spreading. <laughs> Don't know what controls it. Everything people try has failed. Even transline fails on that one. Tough one to control. We, we put that on the test. I teach a noxious weed short course in Montana, which I'm going to do at the end of April. And that's one of the questions we put on the course, course. What is the control strategy for rush skeleton weeds? And the answer is nothing. Okay, now, let's see. You asked me this question. What's this one? The, the other one. Bull. Bull. This is bull thistle. You notice how spiny this one is. Again, very, very common. Animals avoid this one, too. It tend to get, these things, when they're in a rangeland habitat, tend to get selected for 
because uh, animals avoid them. They don't, eat, they, don't, they don't feed on them, and so they feed all around it and ends up selecting for these plants. And the same thing would apply to this one right in here. Do you know what this one is? Very common plant in your area. Another thistle. I'm on the thistles here. Here's a flower, a close-up of the flower. My last name should give you a hint. D. Tomaso is my last name. Uh, there you go, Italian thistle. <laughs> Smaller flower, purple thistle. And of course, this one, you, you, you're sure you know this one. Very common. Very spiny. Now, if I showed you a leaf of this one, you might get it. It's got white veins throughout the leaf. Milk thistle. All three of these thistles are very common in your area. They're not nearly as pervasive as yellow star thistle. They tend to grow more in shaded areas or along fence lines or on roadsides. Sometimes they can move out into a, a, a field, but they typically don't do it. They don't like to be shaded, even by grasses, and so they don't do it nearly as well. Uh, uh, I mean, they like to be shaded, but they don't like to be shaded and competing for, with grasses. So you'll see them underneath trees, but not with grasses. Now, this one is a native plant, and yet a lot of people consider it to be weedy and don't like it. And uh, this is over by Folsom, but it grows very commonly in your area. This is what the flowers look like in the summer. This is a tarweed. Tarweeds are native, but a lot of, uh, a lot of ranchers don't like them. And what's happening now is that tar weeds are not controlled very well by transline. So they're going into these areas, they're treating with transline, getting rid of the star thistle. The, the tar weeds are coming up, and the animals are avoiding the tar weeds, and the tar weeds are becoming, because they're, they're so sticky and resinous, the animals don't like them. But we're in a kind of a dilemma here, because these are, they want to know how to get rid of these things, but they're native. So the best way to do it is to try to manage them so that you have them, but don't, but don't manage for them. And so you may have to use mowing. Mowing's a good strategy on these things. There are other, a lot of things called tar weeds, and a lot of them look like this. They're much spinier, and they still have these, you can almost see these glandular dots on the end of them. Uh, uh, these also don't, are not controlled by star thistle, I mean by transline, and so they tend to take over in areas that are transline treated. This is what they would look like. Actually, this is our transline treated plot, so <laughs> came back in. That was in Folsom. And then, of course, you have a lot of pigweeds. Many of you may know them. They're agricultural weeds. They're also garden weeds. You have tumble pigweed. You have uh, prostrate pigweed. You know that one? And then you have the most common one, which is red root pigweed, like this. But there are a lot of other pigweeds. I'm working on a, on a Weeds of California text, and I've actually managed to almost finish the, uh, actually I've got two books. One is on aquatic plants of the West, and one's on uh, Weeds of California. And um, I have 800 weeds in the state of California, and I've, I've managed to photograph 705 of them already. And uh, when I just pick weeds alone, I've got, I think, nine of them in California. So uh, I think, unfortunately, in the past, the books that you look at only contain the most common ones, and so everybody called the ones that look like this red root pigweed, and there's like four of them that look like this. So maybe this is the reason why some people say, well, I tried this and it didn't work, and I tried that and it didn't work. Well, you might be different, dealing with different species altogether. I collect them, take them into a herbarium, verify them, check them against herbarium specimens, so make sure that all my identifications are correct on these. Okay, and this one you have to know. Right? Poison what? Poison oak, correct. Uh, you know there's only one part of the poison oak plant that does not contain the resin that causes dermatitis. What part of the plant is that? Thank God. The pollen. Thank God. Wind pollinated. <laughs> These are wind pollinated. <laughs> Otherwise, 75%, we would have evolved into a race that was not, you know, <laughs> sensitive to this because 75% of us are sensitive. 25% of us in this room are lucky enough not to be sensitive. Now, raise a hand. How many know they're sensitive? How many people here? What would you estimate, people? Would you say that's 50% or more? 60? Okay, let's say that's 60. I'm in there too. That means that 15% of you are sensitive and don't know it. Well, right. And the other thing is, the other thing about this plant is that we all have different levels of sensitivity, but as you con constantly contact it, you get more and more sensitive. Because what you're building up is you're building up the antibody that attacks it. Now you have more antibody, so the next time you touch it, you're more sensitive <laughs> to it. So 
if you, if you think you're not sensitive, if you say, I'm not sensitive, and I've seen people do this before, you did it as a child. <laughs> you go out and you say, I'm not sensitive, and you rub it all over you. <laughs> well, you better darn well hope that you're not the one that's actually sensitive and doesn't know it. So I could tell you a lot of other stuff about this, but I'll, I'll just go into the ecology a little bit. When it's growing in full sunlight, now, you know the scientific name of this? It's Toxicodendron diversilobum. Toxic, you know what that means, right? Dendron, you know what that means, right? Wood, that means wood. So it's poisonous wood. Diversilobum means diverse lobes, usually dealing with the leaves. But it's also very diverse in its growth form. If you get to a really sunny area, it, the plant will look like the one I just showed you, bushy. If you get to a really shaded area, and this happens to be in Monterey, it becomes viney. So it takes on all kinds of different growth forms. So don't be fooled. What is the best to use to uh, I have a pest notes out. Uh, the, the best two compounds are, are Garlon and, and Roundup treated late season. Uh, there's a pest notes out on the DANR website, or our website, which is WEEDRIC, W-R-I-C, stands for Weed Research and Information Center, dot UC Davis dot edu for education. You, uh, weed Rick, W-R-I-C, W-R-I-C, just one time, <laughs> dot UC Davis, dot edu. Okay, here's a plant that many of you probably don't know, but it's so common in your area. This is central. You know what this is? Hedge parsley. And it produces a seed head like this that sticks all over your clothes. You know what this thing is? hedge parsley, Torlus arvensis. Man, it is awful, and it's really in this area, right in here where you are. And of course, it's common where we are too, but in the foothills is where you see it most commonly. It's a late season plant, so it's going to be an August thing that you're going to get it. What's your recommended uh, 2,4-D, Garlon. Transline is supposed to, supposed to work on it too, although I haven't tried it on it. This one is, uh, is uh, fennel. And fennel is, was introduced here as a food plant, and it's really, it's really spreading in California. It's probably along your areas, too. You might recognize it, the yellow flowers. It smells like anise. It smells really good. So you can eat it? Yeah, uh, well, it's got a little fibrous right now. You know, as it gets wild, it gets fibrous, kind of like wild carrots. You know, they don't taste so good in the wild. Um, but you could if you wanted to. It, it really smells aromatic. It smells like licorice or anise. No, uh-uh. It's a different species, but looks very similar. That one's called, uh, th the scientific name of this one is Funiculum vulgaris. Vulgar you know, when you call somebody vulgar, and you say, you're so vulgar, you know what that really means? You're common. Yeah, right, yeah, you're common. And so you see a, the, the term vulgaris in a lot of Latin names of plants, and that simply means it's common. So this is Funiculum vulgaris, common. But the one that you're using in cooking is usually uh, Anethum graviolens. That's a, it, and it's called dill, dill or fennel. It's a different, different species. Uh, of course, these, these you all know, right? They're, they're all over the place. This is mustards, and th this, this particular mustard, um, let's see which one this is. Uh, I'm not sure which mustard that is. It looked like black mustard. This one right in here looks like a mustard, but um, in reality it's not. I mean, it's, it's not in the Brassica genus. It's been moved out. It's now in a Synapsis genus called Charlock. But it's the one that's most common along the roadside. This is actually a brassica right in, I'm sorry, that one, that one was. That one was a true brassica. That was field, field mustard. This next one right in here is not a true mustard, but it looks like it. And it's very common along your roadsides. It's probably the most common one along your roadsides. Charlock, but people just call it uh, mustard, you know, because it looks so much like a mustard. I see a mustard, <coughs> mustard being used as a field crop now. Well, between rows of, uh -huh. of trees and orchards. Yeah. Yeah, they're not really much weeds, to tell you the truth. You know, in, in Napa Valley, and Sonoma Valley, and in, in the vineyards, um, they don't really cause much damage because they don't really compete. They're, they're winter annuals. They dry out early on, and so they, they really don't compete with the grapes. Grapes are in dormancy. Um, so they could get rid of them as weeds, but they said, you know, why should we do this? Let's just turn it into a festival, and it'll bring in more tourists. It's really not a beneficial to them, and it's not a harm to them. It's just there. So where it's really a problem is in, is in, win is in winter vegetables, because it's a winter vegetable, it's a winter weed. Uh, I'm on the mustards. Th now this one's more of a problematic one. This is the, uh, the one we call short potted mustard, and it's the one you're going to see flowering later in the year. Those other ones are the ones you see now. This is the one you're going to see in the late summer. And this is actually a, a, a biennial perennial. 
Hirschfeldia is the, is the scientific name. Uh, it looks like a mustard. It's in a different genus altogether, but it's called short potted mustard. And this one is spreading into wildland areas. Those other mustards don't spread so much into wild, wild. They're not really that, again, that big of a problem. Uh, maybe a garden weed that you've encountered is this one, a little mustard right in here that's called swine crest that kind of stinks a little bit. A little dissected leaf and a little tiny fruit right here. This is one of the major garden problems and mostly a, a nursery problem. So those of you who are working in the nursery area know this one. Um, other mustards, you know this one, right? Yeah, and you can tell that because the, the, the fruit looked like a little purse, shepherd's purse. Again, this is a winter. Most mustards are winter annuals. Most of them are winter annuals, and, they're, and so they tend to be garden weeds, vegetable weeds. And that's, that's shepherd's purse in full, full glory. Uh, some of the more noxious mu mustards would include things like hoary crests, which you find I uh, along the coast, and you find occasionally here a major problem in, in Reno. And so when you get into Nevada, this becomes a major problem. Uh, in California and in Nevada, we have another, another plant called perennial pepperweed, which you may know. This root is about an inch thick. I it's uh, extremely difficult to control. It's taken over our wetland environments. Um, it even, you can even find it in salt areas like the estuaries, roadsides alfalfa fields. Let's see if I have a picture of it. This is Lassen County, and everything you see there, this was an alfalfa field, everything you see there is perennial pepperweed. And the stems are made out of, are high in silica, and so when the plant uh, uh, dies, it does not break down, and it forms this very thick litter of dead stems. And even if you control it, you end up with a moonscape, because nothing else can come back in. Of course, you know radishes. There's two different types of radishes. Uh, one of them has a yellow flower, and uh, its fruit, it, there's a yellow, sort of a yellowish flower here, and its fruit tend to be more uh, lobes. See, you can see indentations, constrictions. And then the, the other one is uh, the purple or white flowered one. They're just starting to come up, the purple and white flowered ones. The yellow ones started coming up earlier. And uh, its fruit tend to be fatter and more tapered to a point like this. Both of these, again, are winter annuals in the mustard family. So we've got a lot of mustard weeds in California. Uh, mustards are really common to temperate areas. They're not so common in tropical areas, and we eat a lot of the mustards. Of course, you know, everything that's in the broccoli group, cauliflower, all that stuff, and they cause go they're actually poisonous, and they cause goiter. And to get rid of goiter, you, you eat iodine. So our salt is all iodinized because we eat so many of these. They're called coal crops. We eat so many of these. Uh, we don't have goiter anymore because our salt has enough iodine in it to, to eliminate the problem. But we would get goiter because we eat, at least a lot of us, eat a lot of these members of this family. Here's another native plant. Uh, you know what this one is? Yeah, but I'll show you a close-up there and then you won't have any problem. Here's a native plant that seems to love disturbance. Very common in California. It's become a major problem in, in orchards as a native. And it's also very poisonous to, to animals. Fiddle neck. Fiddle neck. Right. And Cinchia intermedia. Uh, this one causes liver poisoning, much like the common groundsel does. Beautiful little flowers, and the, you can characterize this family, which is the Boraginaceae, the Borage family, because they're scorpioid. You know, they're like fiddlenecks. That's where it got its name, right in here. And so they go, uh, one at a time, the flowers open up. Here, and then here, and then next one, next one, and then this one will open, and it'll unwind as they open. R really very pretty. Now, here's the most, probably the most common garden plant that you have, maybe this one in annual bluegrass. You know what this one is? You probably never see it from this close up. This is common chickweed. Probably. You know how you can tell this? It's got these little mouse-eared, uh, uh, that's one petal. Those two lobes are one petal. It's just split in the middle, so they're mouse ears. So I'd say, how many petals are here? It's not 10, it's five. Lamb's quarter. Uh, they're common garden plants, too. Uh, mo more important in agricultural area. And you can tell them because they've got these little, looks like little balloons, little air sacs or water sacs on the top of the young leaves. Um, if you blow those up, they, they do actually hold water in the plant, probably a way that the young leaves store some water. It could also probably hold some salt, too. And that's what they look like. You've probably seen a lot of these things. They don't have obvious flowers. They're wind, wind pollinated. Major weeds. How about that one? You know that one? Maybe you don't know it like that. But I'll bet you you know the next one. <laughs> or Russian thistle is what we call it now. Now, 
Anytime you see a Western movie, and there's these guys standing there like this, and they're in a ghost town, and tumbleweeds are blowing across the thing, it's phony. These are not native. They're native to Russia. They weren't introduced here until 1850, and then they were introduced in South Dakota. They didn't become problems until early in the 1900s. They were never in the Western habitats. <laughs> and yet we always associate them with Western movies. But they're not. You know that the way they work, they call them tumbleweeds, they, they break off at the bottom, and then they tumble along, and the seeds are really actually very tightly attached at each of those little axles. So if you go back in here, see all the little flowers? There's a flower and a flower and a flower, and they're all right in there. And the seeds are tightly attached. And of course, you don't want the seeds to be loosely attached because the plant would go boom, and 10,000 seed would fall in one area. So you want just a couple of seed falling every time the plant falls. Now, the interesting thing about that plant is their growth form is not round. They're oval, because if it's just round, it just rolls like that. What it, what it really wants to be is oval, so it goes kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And every time it hits, it drops a few seed. The plant does not do well when there's grasses around. It only likes to, to, to establish itself in open areas. Now, isn't that a perfect strategy? When it gets into a grassland, the plant just tumbles along the grasses very gently, drops no seed. Until it gets to an open area where it hits something hard, boom, 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 and then it drops all its seed. Where do you usually find the plant? Highways. Because it's bouncing along the, the roadside there and dropping all of its seed that then wash off to the edge. Another plant in California that looks very much like it is called kochia. That's the scientific name. It's also the common name. And uh, from a distance, you would look at that and you'd say Russian thistle. But if you look closely at it, it does not have the spines. It's in the same family, very closely related, but there's no spines. Now, that sure looks pretty, doesn't it? Well, probably our, this one is field bindweed. Some of you may call it morning glory, but field bindweed was, is a name that's accepted now. Uh, this is in the top 10 worst weeds of the world. Uh, and that's a pretty solid mass right there. Its roots go down 30 feet. It's almost impossible to get rid of in the long run. But its flowers are very pretty, right? Pretty flowers, but... This is one of the worst weeds. If you're working in gardens, you probably know this plant. All the little spurges that are in your garden, they all bleed a milky white latex. This is in the same family as poinsettia, which also bleeds a milky white latex. This is in the same genus as poinsettia. Of course, the red parts of poinsettia are leaves, not flowers. The flowers are just little tiny structures in here in this plant. Very low lying. This is spurge. And there's a lot of them. There's a prostrate spurge, spotted spurge, and a few other ones. Are they what? Uh, there are species within this genus that are very, very poisonous. I don't know of anybody that would eat these. Uh, there is one species in Australia that's used, because that, that white milky latex that's in this plant is very caustic. And it's, in Australia, there's a species that's used for branding cattle. It's so caustic. Yeah, you wouldn't want to eat anything in this family. There are some really toxic things in this family. Um, castor bean, for example, is in this family. It does not bleed a milky white latex, but very, very poisonous in this family. And some other things that cause severe dermatitis in this, in this family. One other thing that's in this family that you see all the time is this plant right in here along roadsides. Late season plant, very whitish in color, low growing, little bundle called turkey mullion or called doveweed. Now, this plant is native. It's a little bit of a problem in orchards, but when, whenever people t come to me and they'll say, how do you get rid of this on the roadsides? I'll say, why? It's low-growing, not a fire hazard, native plant. Why? Let's leave it along the roadsides. Why do we have to worry about this plant? Not a visibility issue, not invasive, native. So some people call it a weed. I, I don't call it a weed most of the time. But you see it all the time, which is the reason I point it out to you. This is already starting to come up. I got a couple more minutes here, and I'll finish up. Vetch. There's lots of different vetches. Uh, this is the most common one, the one that has the bright purple flowers that are multiple on a raceme along the stem. But the second one that's very common are the ones that just have a couple of little flowers in the axis. So that one's Vicia velosa, and the other one, hairy vetch, and this one's Vicia sativa. Okay, you know this one? Scotch broom, you got it. Uh, bright yellow flowers, um, produces small leaves. The key characteristic here is an angled stem. Angled stem. Uh, closely related to it, French broom. 
obvious leaves. Okay, that's the big difference. And the leaves are not deciduous. They stay on all year long. Big leaves. That's French broom again. You can see the leaves in here. Much bigger than you'll get in Scotch broom. The third species that you have here is Spanish broom. All three of these are in different genera of the same family, the pea family. These are all introduced weeds, major, major problems. Yeah, they're pretty, but they're invasive. Um, this one has a round stem, and that's what separates it. A, 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 this is a, um, a Spanish broom, has a round stem. Uh, I wanted to point this out because they're so common. This is the last one I'll talk about. These are the two common filleries that you see. This one is red, uh, red stem fillery. This one is white stem fillery. Now, there's a third one you have around here, which is the broadleaf fillery. And it's easy to tell apart because the leaves are so broad. They're not, they're not uh, divided. But these two are the most common. This one, has a much, uh, uh, this one right here is a much more dissected leaf than this one. But they both have compound leaves. OK? Well, in rangeland, these are really desirable. I mean, the most ranchers love these things. They're excellent forage. And uh, the only time they're really a problem is in uh, agricultural crops or in your gardens, probably. Uh, I, I'm not sure how to get little, well, little, um, little purple flowers. There you go. Yes, this is in the geranium family. Correct. How do these fruits mean? Yeah, they do. Yeah, these ones are not the the ones the, the geraniums roll up like that. These ones roll like that. Okay? And you know what they do that for? So they can plant themselves. So they get in the soil. They're very uh, moisture sensitive. They lay out straight when there's a lot of moisture. They twist when it's dry. So it, and they got all hairs that point upward at the base of the fruit. So when they touch the soil, once they dig in a little bit, you know, the, the hairs keep them in there, hold them in there. Then they screw themselves in. And then they straighten out, screw themselves in, straighten out. And eventually, they plant themselves. So, I. This will be my last one because this is such a neat plant. <laughs> okay, this is, this is, anybody know this? Okay, if I tell you this is St. John's Wort, you know that one? We call it Klamath weed in California. It's St. John's Wort. And you know what St. John's Wort is used for now, right? Anti depression. In California, I mean, in the United States, I think it's uh, 20 to 30 percent of the market. It's over 50 percent of the market in Europe. That's where it's native to. Well, this was a major range weed. See the little flowers back in the 40s? And we introduced our first biocontrol agent into the United States to control this weed. It's a beetle called Chrysalina quadrigemini, or the Klamath weed beetle. It's related to, the, uh, to um, ladybugs. And it devastated this plant. It knocked it back by 99%. This used to be a rangeland weed. It's poisonous to cattle or to any light-skinned animal that eats it. Wiped it out. Then, all of a sudden, you know, a couple of years ago, this became the, the big plant for antidepressant. You got all kinds of things on here. Now, look, this is how we full cycled in this world. Now I got people calling me saying, damn, how do I get rid of that insect? That I'm trying to grow this thing, and I can't get rid of that darn insect. The preceding program was part two of two parts, each 90 minutes long. There is support material available at this website, including quizzes, handouts, and lecture outlines for all presentations. Consult the UCTV programming guide for the date and time that other lectures in the series will be shown. It's the Definitive Guide to Gardening, produced by the University of California. The California Master Gardener Handbook contains over 700 pages of in-depth information on topics such as selecting varieties, planting, growth cycles, pruning, irrigation, and harvesting. The California Master Gardener Handbook is available along with other gardening publications on the ANR Catalog website at anrcatalog.ucdavis.edu.